In example three, we have a study that was conducted two years in a row, um, collecting data on how many middle school students first used a whole cigarette, cigar, smokeless tobacco product before age 11. So we'll let the data from 2005 serve as our first sample. And the data from, let's see, 2006 serve as our second sample. So this means that N1 is equal to 1,447, and P1 hat, our first sample proportion, is 0 0.078. We can verify that our number of successes is approximately 113. And our number of failures is approximately 1,334. For the second sample in 2006, we had a sample size of 1,246 students, a sample proportion of 0 0.086. We had 107 successes. Sorry, that should be N2. And N2 times P2 hat, or times 1 minus P2 hat, gives us approximately 1,139 failures. So we have enough successes and enough failures. The ultimate question we're trying to answer is, do these results suggest that the proportion of middle school students in Illinois using a tobacco product was greater in 2006 than 2005? So looking at our sample data, 8.6% of students in 2006 reported doing that, only 7.8% in 2005. So we're going to construct our confidence interval estimate and see if this is enough evidence to show that there is an increase. So taking our numbers of successes, our sample sizes, we can come back to StatCrunch. For our first sample, we had 113 successes and a sample size of 1,447. For our second sample, we had 1,000. Nope. We had 107 successes out of 1,246 students, and we want a confidence interval of 93%. So we compute, get our lower and upper limit, which allows us to construct our confidence interval and provide our interpretation. So the conditions are met again in this case. To construct a confidence interval estimate for P1 minus P2, because each of our samples has at least 10 successes and 10 failures, the 93% confidence interval estimate for P1 minus P2 is negative 0 0.0270 to 0 0.0115. So can we conclude that one is greater than the other, or are they equal to each other? In this case, 0 is included in that interval. So since zero is in our interval, we have to conclude that the two population proportions are equal, meaning the proportion of students who reported using tobacco products before age 11 in 2005 is the same as the proportion in 2006. In this case, the data doesn't support the claim that the proportion was greater in 2006. So again, since zero is in that interval, we have to assume that the two proportions are equal, which in this case means if we were able to survey every single student in 2005 and every single student in 2006, 
we would have ended up with exactly the same proportion. In example four, we're looking at heart disease and whether it affects a greater proportion of men than women. So we'll break our samples into the proportion of men, the proportion of women. So we'll let N1 equal 1,219,784. So this is related to the number of women who, were, who died due to heart disease. Our sample proportion isn't given to us in this case. What we are given is our number of successes. In this case, 292,188 women were killed. So that's our number of successes. So in order to get our sample proportion, since that's not provided for us, we need to take our number of successes divided by our sample size to get approximately 0 0.2395. So since we're specifically given that number of successes, to get our number of failures, we can just take N1 minus the 292,000 to get 927,646. So a slightly different approach to getting our numbers, numbers of success and failures, since we weren't given the sample proportion. In this case, we were just given that number of successes. And now for men, we had 1,217,379 men who died due to heart disease. Our number of successes, I'm sorry, let me go back for a second. I realize I was misrepresenting this problem. N1 here represents the total number of women who died in the US. Our number of successes is the number of women who died due to heart disease. N2 is representing the total number of men who died, and our number of successes, the 307,225, represents the number of men who died due to heart disease. So I apologize for that. I was misrepresenting some of that information. <clears throat> so in order to get our sample size, or our sample proportion, P2 hat, we would take our number of successes divided by the sample size to get approximately 0 0.2524. And then we can find our number of failures by taking our sample size minus the 307,225 to get about 910 people. So we have at least 10 successes, at least 10 failures. So we have the conditions met to go ahead and construct this confidence interval. So we can flip over to StatCrunch, go back to the edit screen for this two sample purport, proportion summary. Our number of successes for women were 292,188 out of 1,219,784. And for men, the number of successes is 307,225 out of the 1,217,379. And in this case, we want a 97% confidence interval. So again, we get our lower and upper limits, and we can interpret those results. So the conditions are met to construct a confidence interval. For P1 minus P2, because both our samples had at least 10 successes and 10 failures. The 97% confidence interval estimate for P1 minus P2 is negative 0.0140 to negative 0 0.0116. Since all values in our confidence interval 
are less than zero, we conclude that P1 is less than P2. So in the context of our data, our first sample proportion represented the number of women who died due to heart disease, or the percent, the proportion of women. Our second sample proportion represented the proportion of men who died due to heart disease. So if we're saying that P1 is less than P2, that means that a greater number or a greater proportion of men die each year due to heart disease than women. So yes, in this case, the data supports the claim being made in the problem. The data does suggest that heart disease affects a greater proportion of men than women, since we're concluding that P1 has to be less than P2, since all the values in our confidence interval were less than zero.